I wonder whether the concept that I've indicated will be our theme tonight strikes you as being a new or novel one or a recent development in people's thinking. Really, that's not the case. You're going to see as we look at the Bible together through this discourse that really this concept of a universal religion is almost as old as mankind itself. And let me just say at this point, neither is this concept basically a wrong one. Because the time is coming when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We were already sharing somewhat in that concept in the hymn that we sang just a while ago. I wonder if you just noted carefully the words as you were singing them. I repeat, there's nothing basically wrong with the concept. The scriptures do talk about a unity. The Lord Jesus did in John chapter 17. Though if I'm reading it and interpreting it aright, he was not talking about an amalgamation of all kinds of religions. He was rather talking about what the Apostle Paul mentioned in his letter to the Ephesian Christians in chapter 4 and verse 3. He was trying to encourage those early Christians to maintain the unity of the Spirit. This is a given unity, not something that we can work up by our machinations here at this human level but a God-given one of which he is the author and the most we can do is maintain it. I believe in that kind of unity and that's surely coming because the prophets tell plainly enough and frequently enough that the time's coming when you won't have to say to somebody, know the Lord, for all shall know the Lord from the least to the greatest. The day's coming when he shall be in fact King of kings and Lord of lords. But I'm digressing a little. Let me say it again, though I'm repeating myself. There's nothing wrong with the notion, generally, of a universal religion. But mankind's attempts to bring that about have been so far from what God intends it should be in almost every instance, the attempt of mankind to achieve a universal religion amounts to human defiance of God and his ways. It's a declaration of independence from God, invariably. Now I'm selecting the 13th chapter of the Revelation as a starting point not that I'm going to have the time to deal with many aspects of that chapter as much as I would love to. Other features of it are going to come out in further talks in this series. I perhaps should indicate at this point that we intend to come to grips with other related subjects to this particular one tonight. And we'll be doing so at monthly intervals. This is the second of a series. If you weren't able to be present for the first, these addresses are being taped and if you'd like to buy a cassette with these addresses, the two tonight's and the previous one and those that subsequently follow, you might indicate that you would like to have them and you can have them for the cost of the cassette, something around the, the tune of two dollars, but that by the by. There are some features of this, as I say, that we must expand at greater length, though not tonight. It's verse 8 that especially is relevant to what we're saying tonight. 7 and 8, I suppose. An authority was given to it, that is the beast, over every tribe and people and tongue and nation, and all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone, that is, whose name has not been written whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb that was slain. I propose to tackle this subject 
in three phases, if I may. Let me first appeal to history, past, and just highlight for you some well-known but abortive attempts to establish a world religion. And then I want us to look at present day developments and trends and the third phase of it I want to try to earth to our application. What effect, if these things that I'm speaking about and that the Word of God talks about, if these things are so, what's the point so far as we are concerned? What personal application does it have? There's no real point in me just going into a, an academic speculative argument. I'm well aware that this is considered by many to be controversial. I'm well aware of that. And for this very reason, some people skirt the subject altogether. And I come at it with the conviction that the Holy Spirit of God quickened men of old. As God breathed, these men were quickened to record these things and therefore they are there to be understood. My concern is not what this and that and the other one says it means. Can we get the Bible meaning simply and clearly? I don't want to pit one denomination's view against another. Can the scriptures be simply understood? And if so, what effect, as I say, what effect does it have on us? I want to come out at a very personal level, if you'll permit me to. Now first, let's just take a little stock. I said a moment ago that there have been many, many attempts to introduce a universal religion. Going back to our earliest beginnings, and let me cite as a case in point to begin with, in Genesis chapter 10 and chapter 11, we won't be able to stay to read it in full, but here was an attempt, a very early attempt, under the leadership of one called Nimrod, who was a mighty man, we're introduced to him first in Genesis chapter 10, as a hunter, but he became a socio-political leader and headed up the first attempt to unify mankind both in a religious way as well as a political way. This set of circumstances that we read in chapters 10 and 11 come in the context of the Noachic flood when the world was deluged and only those who obeyed the faithful preaching of Noah, eight souls in fact, were spared. And then in the renovated earth, if I can use that expression, God gave clear instructions as to what they should do. And it's just as clear and evident that they were determined to do the other thing than what God had instructed. Until you come in the 11th chapter of Genesis to read, now the whole earth had one language and few words. And as men migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. Now see the reason why. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now here's the contrariness of mankind. God had told them following the flood to disperse throughout the earth to be fruitful and to multiply and re-inhabit the earth. God said, spread out. And they said, no, we want to stay together. Lest we be scattered abroad on the face of the whole earth. This was their reason. So what do they do? 
They think one of the things that must surely bind them together is to have a universal religion. And we come to that, I imagine it's fairly well known to you, the incident of the Tower of Babel, as it's come to be called. Now, this is a much misunderstood passage. We do wrong to these people, we sell them short, if we subscribe to the popular idea that these people were primitive and that they had some notion that they could build a tower up to heaven. Now that isn't what the scriptures say. They were not so naive. This tower that was built or attempted to be built was designed as a place of worship. Replicas of this kind of thing can be found in the ancient world and have been found by archaeologists. They are called by some a ziggurat, which resembles a pyramid, though on one long side is a great succession of stairs heading up to a pinnacle point and this particular one was designed, and this, I assure you, is the meaning in the Hebrew. It doesn't come through nearly as clearly in the King James English. But it was designed so that the roof at its pinnacle depicted all the constellations of the heavens. And that became the object of worship. In other words... They were the very most ancient believers in the stars. They worshipped the hosts of heaven. And it was for this reason that God was angered with them. And the fact that this was an act of defiance, seeking to do the very opposite to what God had clearly told them to do. Instead of scattering throughout the earth and replenishing it, they determined to do the other thing. This tower with its top depicting the heavens. They were not so foolish as to think they could build a human structure that would actually enter that dimension of the heavenly places. They were not so ignorant. In fact, some of these ancient peoples were very well skilled in some arts that have long since been lost in antiquity. And we, with all our modern technology, have not been able to emulate successfully. Don't dismiss these people as ignorant. What they did, I repeat, was a clear act of defiance. And so it came to nothing. Now, I've obviously got to be selective. We can't take every instance of this, but believe me, there are many. Let me, for example, refer you to Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel where we're told he sought to enforce on the world, that is the world of his day, and he was almost without equal as being a prince, not only over his immediate people, but over all the peoples at least within reasonable distance of him. He's spoken of as the greatest of kings. And the actual language used that he was king over all the earth. Now, however far you care to take that, the point is we're being introduced here to another attempt to force a universal worship. He had a great image constructed. And whenever a signal was given, everyone, no exception, everyone, was to bow down and worship this image. And those who dared not to would pay for it by their lives. And you are familiar, I'm sure, with the story of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, the Hebrew people who defied the order. And as you know, were cast into a furnace. A furnace heated seven times more than its normal heat. So intense that those who took the Hebrew three to throw them in were consumed by the flame. And yet, not a tiny hair of the clothing even of these three was so much as singed. 
And when Nebuchadnezzar came to see how these three fared, he saw a fourth, which the scriptures depict, I believe, to be the pre-existent Son of God. Like unto is the very words used in the King James, the Son of God. It was no other than the Son of God. There are two biblical attempts that I've indicated. We can take stepping stones down through the years since to see this same thing. In the third century, there was a Persian by the name of Mani, M-A-N-I, who sought to create a religion that would transcend all national and international restrictions. It was an inclusive kind of religion. He put Buddha and Zoroaster and Jesus and others on an equal footing. All mankind was really divine, Mani said. And all we need to do is release the divine spark within ourselves. In the 18th century, there was a, a general, what shall I call it, an intellectual uh, movement among people seeking to find the lowest common denominator in all religions. And so that they wouldn't be offensive to this and that and the other world religion, they tried to eliminate words that they regarded as controversial. And instead of talking about God, they talked about virtue and morality and these kind of innocuous things. In the 19th century, there was a Hindu by the name of Vivekananda summoned what he called a parliament of all religions in Chicago in the USA. He said, and I'm quoting, all paths lead to the same God. Brahma of the Hindu, Ahura Mazda of the Zoroastrians, Buddha of Buddhism, Jehovah of the Jews, Jesus of the Christians, and so on. They are all really one and the same. As I say, he summoned a parliament, his language, of all religions. Now, not surprisingly, when men begin to think in those sort of terms and try to reduce religion to a, the lowest common denominator, it inevitably ends in elimination. Vital things go by the board. We've got intellectual giants, for so they were, and I'm not being sarcastic in any way, men like Rousseau, Goethe, and these men who were acknowledged scholars, who promulgated a concept that was really a revival of pantheism, which means all is God. This movement was known and still is known by the word humanism. I was interested to see what an ordinary secular dictionary would say about humanism. Let me quote from a, a dictionary I have on my shelves. Humanism is devotion to human interests, a system of thought or action devoted thereto as distinct from divine, or within the human race in general as distinct from the individual. Now this excludes God and the individual man. We talk about humanism in broad general terms and it has no real concern for individual need. There is that movement in the world that's described by a technical word called syncretism. It's exemplified by such movements, for example, as the Baha'i teaching. Any of you that have been to Sydney, particularly if you've come into Sydney by air, would have seen the nine-sided temple on the Mona Vale Road at Ingleside. It, it stands out. It, it's painted white, and on a clear summer day, you can see this edifice for miles away. The Baha'i movement. This is an attempt, again, to amalgamate all religions. 
The nine-sided building represents their belief that there are nine major world religions. It's an interesting situation. I've been in their building in Ingleside, in Sydney. They have no clergy as such. They have no preaching. Each of their services is conducted by, for the want of a better word, a layman. And all they do in the service is simply read from the sacred writings of all these nine religions, the Old Testament and the New Testament included. There is that that I believe is a more up-to-date attempt, tarred with exactly the same brush, which has come to be known under the name of ecumenism. Now I realise that's a pretty broad term and would want a lot of qualification. It is, I believe, an umbrella and I haven't a doubt whatever that the people who are infused by this and are promulgating it have nothing but the best motives. But some of us who stood askance from it when it began from the, the meeting in Amsterdam about 30 years ago, give or take a year, those of us who were concerned for certain very real reasons have since had every cause to be confirmed in their concerns. Now I'm not, I do believe, naive or stupid. I'm not blind to some of the good that ecumenism has done and is doing. Their world relief programs, for example, are practically without equal. And true, in the name of the Christian church, there have been some wonderful things achieved in the area of human need, and I would be the last one to disparage or speak ill of that in any way. But to my mind, that only makes the thing even more subtle from its spiritual implications, from that point of view. And it's no secret whatever that the prominent people in this movement are doing their best to make overtures to the non-Christian religions, again, seeking to strike a common least denominator. Really, you can't see the implications of ecumenism in this country. You need to talk to men like Richard Wormbrand and hear how those who are given prominence in the ecumenical movement are some of the most bitter and intense persecutors of the Christians. They are absolute stoolies for communist governments. Now that's a pretty serious charge to make, but I make it, and it can be documented. I know that sort of a statement would come as something horrific to those who are so wrapped up in it here. But I tell you, there are many involved in it that are not aware of its implications. It's only in the last couple of world gatherings of this very group where positive moves have been afoot to hamper, not to say eliminate, the work of evangelical missionaries in some of the major continents. True, this movement is opposed to the evangelical gospel. And I say, brethren, this comes under the same category of these other things we've been talking about. It's just the same thing in a different guise. And many, many earnest, sincere people, I believe, are being hoodwinked to, act something, to accept something that's less than what is thus and thus saith the Lord. And those who become so infused with the thing, you can watch their evangelical light, if they ever had one, go out. They no longer dogmatically stand where the Bible stands. I'm sorry to say that, but it's my conviction. And we've had 30 years to see what effect this would be. Where the World Council of Churches began, largely dominated by the major bodies within the Western part of civilization, now is a very different story. 
The Afro-Asian bloc is outnumbering the Western bloc about two to one, which puts a different complexion on the whole business. And I tell you, in this last assembly of the World Council of Churches, when there were some who sought to ask for clemency for Christians being imprisoned for their conscience sake behind the Iron Curtain. Do you think that they could get this even recognised, much less a motion agreed to? The Soviet Afro-Asian bloc really did act as a bloc and this thing couldn't even be heard. But this being done in the name of God as a world church I know that when I say that, people are going to take issue with that and say, but it's not a world church. Well, I wish they'd communicate with one another better because I've got a little booklet on my shelf written by one of their ardent supporters and the title of it is The World Church. Friends, it is an attempt at that by what any other name. And I say, and it seems so to me, you may take issue, of course, if you will, but I say this is only further greasing the passage for the acceptance of what is almost upon us, a worldwide apostate church. But there are some things to be developed immediately that will soon make this beyond the realm of controversy. What mankind has succeeded, well, I shouldn't use that word, what he has failed to achieve by his own unaided efforts, I believe Satan is going to enable him to achieve it. The trend we have observed in the past, over past centuries, is only paving the way when in the time that God has appointed when the Antichrist will be revealed, the wicked one who is able to deceive, if it were possible, the very elect, is going to see this thing come to full fruition. And so many will be duped by their present method of brainwashing as to go into this thing without being aware of it. I'm convinced of this. As sure as God begins to do something, Satan begins to counterfeit it. Now, that's a story as old as the Bible. You remember when Moses went before Pharaoh and sought the release of the children of Israel and sought to give some proof positive that he was indeed the messenger of God when he cast his rod to the ground and it became a serpent, all the Egyptian soothsayers and necromancers did likewise. The magicians, they turned their rods into serpents. When the plagues were coming upon Egypt at God's direction, as Moses stretched his rod out across the land, the, the land was infested with one plague after the other. Frogs, lice, and so on. The Egyptian magicians did the same. That always strikes me really as an odd piece of work. I would have thought it would have been something really demonstrative if they could have removed the plagues. Instead of that, they just seemed to add to them. What a great help that was. But as sure as God begins to do something, you can expect Satan to counterfeit it. And as there is a biblical given unity, you can expect there to be a satanic counterpart. And there is. As we read that 13th chapter of the Revelation, there is most certainly and definitely to be a counterfeit Christ or Antichrist he's spoken of. Now, there will be, and the 13th chapter of Revelation gives us a bit of an inkling of it, a counterfeit trinity. There will be promised as a part of this whole thing a counterfeit freedom. Now, the spirit of Antichrist is already at work, we know that much, and has been from the first century. If you'd like to just make sure of that and turn to the little epistle of John, in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 3, 
we read, and every spirit which does not confess Jesus is not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, of which you heard that it was coming, and now is in the world already. The spirit of Antichrist, do you see? And Jesus said there would be many come in his name and say that they were Christ, and so on. In the same little book, in 1 John, go back a chapter, chapter 2 uh, and verse 18, 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. There were to be many Antichrists. But let's be clear about this too. The scriptures speak of all these expressions, the spirit, the many persons, uh, passing as Antichrist to be headed up into one great figurehead. A single person, clearly described as Antichrist. This is the one Jesus was talking about in the Gospel according to John. Just if you like to quickly note it. In John chapter 5 and verse 43, Jesus here is prophesying and he says, I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. He knew that the Antichrist was coming and that many would be duped by him. The dragon that's spoken of in the chapter 13 of the Revelation is the counterpart, is Satan's counterpart of God the Father. The beast or the Antichrist, as he's variously described, is the satanic counterpart of the Son. The false prophet is the satanic counterfeit of the Spirit of the living God, none other than the Holy Spirit. Here is a satanic trinity referred to in that chapter and in other chapters of the book of the Revelation. And there is promised, as invariably there is with this sort of thing, a new kind of freedom. Not freedom in the best sense and truest sense of the word. The communist talks about freedom. He talks about freeing Poland and freeing Hungary and freeing these other satellite countries. You want to talk to some of those people who've been fortunate enough to get out and to get to real freedom. And you'll begin to understand what some of this freedom means. It will mean a political and economic and religious strangulation. Nothing short of that. And by some means, whether it's a union membership, whether it's a security card of some kind, I'm not prepared to even hazard a guess. That would be pure hypothesis. But there, by some means or another... It's going to be such that you'll neither be able to buy nor sell under that system of things. That's freedom. Surely nobody would be duped. Now, these things are coming upon us. They are near even at the doors. What manner of persons then ought we to be if these things be so? If this coming world church is not of God, how shall we know it? How shall we recognise it? How is it going to affect us? How can true belief survive in the face of this mass deception? Is it possible? Well, I believe we need to be able to answer those questions to understand, to begin with, the second book of Thessalonians. Can we have a quick look there? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our assembling to meet him, we beg you, brethren, not to be quickly shaken in mind or excited, either by spirit or by word or by letter purporting to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come, listen, unless the rebellion, the rebellion, The definite article there comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. 
Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you this? And you know what is restraining him so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now restrains, notice it's he who now restrains, notice the personal pronoun, restrains it will do so until he's taken out of the way and then that lawless one shall be revealed. Now if plain English is saying anything there, it's clear that the man of sin, that antichrist, the satanic counterpart of Christ cannot be made known and revealed until the Christian church has joined its glorious Lord in the heavens. That which was talked about in our previous topic in this series and which if you missed that you can read in the fourth and fifth chapters of the first book of Thessalonians. You see, second Thessalonians follows right on from first Thessalonians. This comes in right sequence. We're going to be saying more about that when we look piecemeal at the books of Thessalonians in our morning studies. But let it be clear enough there that this Antichrist cannot be revealed until the church is taken out of the way. He who restrains is none other than the Holy Spirit. If you think this world is bad enough as things stand at the present time, and you have a right to think that, can your mind stretch to what it will be like when the restraining hand of God is off this generation altogether? When the bride has been caught away to the marriage supper of the Lamb with the bridegroom and men revert to type, as Peter uses the expression, to brute beasts? It's dreadful to contemplate. It will be such a time, Jesus said, as never has been in the history of mankind or ever will be repeated again. But the good news, and you might say this is a depressing kind of subject, no, friends, we need to be alert. We are not children of darkness that these things should take us unawares. There's good news for those who see to it that their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. These things, remember, as we were reading the chapter, were clearly to be for those whose names were not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. For those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, there is a deliverance. I believe you see it plain enough in Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 10, Because you have kept my word of patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial which is coming on the whole world. I want you to notice the little word from. I will keep you from the hour of trial. The Christian church is not going to endure that hour of trial. It won't be here on the face of this earth while these things are taking place. Then you say to me, well, who then are the saints who are referred to in chapter 13, in particular verse 7? I want you to understand that this is not referring to the Christian church. The church of Christ, the church which is his body, those who've been born of his spirit, washed in his blood, whose names are written in the Lamb Book of Life, are taken out of. Those who are alive and remain are suddenly translated. Those who have gone before, their graves are going to be opened and a resurrection body will come forth and be joined by the Spirit. And we shall join the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Then that man of sin is revealed and then begins to come into effect some of these things we've been thinking about and speaking about and reading about here. Then who are these people in the 13th chapter of Revelation who come out of this great tribulation period at the cost of their lives, I would have you notice? They are martyrs. They are so described in the book. You see that? It's clear enough. It's also mentioned in the 7th chapter of the Revelation. Can we see that? Quickly, just look in Revelation chapter 7. In particular, verse 13, Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes, and whence have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. 
and he said to me, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation, or as it puts it in the Greek, the tribulation, the great one. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I believe the only logical explanation of that is that here are people who have heard the Christian message and spurned it, but who, upon the taking out of the body of Christ, will realize what they've done and will be prepared now to accept the truth and pay for it by their lives. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sits upon the throne will shelter them with his presence. That's a word that's so often quoted at funerals, but it seems to me it's taken out of context so to do. This mystery seal that the people are going to have to take on, whether they like it or not, or else die for the consequence, this mystery seal that many people have just wasted time in speculating about, is, as I say, saying it again, for those whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So the real issue here is for you. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, or is it not? If it is not, and you know that it's not, then I have to tell you, you have nothing to look forward to but a certain fearful anticipation of judgment and these things that are written that are coming upon the face of the earth. The antidote to that mark of the beast, as it's called, is the seal of God. If you have the seal of God upon you, you'll be caught up with his bride and won't need to have any concern whatever about that 666 mark, whatever it is. I'd like you quickly, I realize that time is more than gone, but there are some very important verses I want to read, and I'd like you to list them and read them more leisurely when you get home and let the message sink in, really grip you. I'd like you to see in the Word of God, not my Word, the word of God, that God sets a seal upon those who are truly his. In Ephesians chapter 1, for example, let's look at it. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. Ephesians 1, 13 says, In him you, it's speaking of Christ, of course, in him you also who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. If you heard the gospel, if you believed it, you really believed in him, not that you joined some denomination or accepted some odd doctrine or anything of the kind. This is a personal relationship with the living Christ. When that has happened for you, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now bear that verse in mind, for there are many other relevant verses. Look in the same book in Ephesians chapter 4. Now, and verse 30, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30 reads, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. If you are born of his Spirit, you have received this seal. And what is it about? It's sealing you against that day that's coming upon the world. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. It's better ended as an engagement ring, if you want to put it literally, so that when a young man puts an engagement ring upon the one whom he loves above all others, he's saying, you are virtually my wife. You are spoken for, you are mine, I am yours. It's something more than a just let's try it and see whether it works out. It's more in the sense of the betrothal that's spoken of in New Testament times and Old Testament for that matter too. The Holy Spirit is our engagement ring. God puts his seal on us. This is our guarantee that we're not going to be a part of those dreaded things that are coming upon the earth in the latter days. He has put his seal upon us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Let's look in 2 Timothy, please, chapter 2 and verse 19. 
2 Timothy 2.19, which reads, But God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. This is the seal of God upon those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, your name is either written there or it isn't written there. There's no mutual ground here. You can't opt out of either. You can't say, well, I want to be neutral in this. I don't want to get involved. Why should I be? There is no mutual ground. The Bible knows nothing of it and speaks nothing of it. Either your name is in the Lamb's book of life or it's not in the Lamb's book of life. And Revelation chapter 13 spells out what is happening for those whose names are not written there. Now then, the important question should be, how may I get my name written in the Lamb's book of life? How can I know? How can I be sure? How can these things hold no terror for me? I don't want to be a part of this coming world religion. I want to be a part of the unity of the spirit that's spoken about in Ephesians chapter 4. Right. If you believe that Jesus died on the cross instead of you, that's right, he took your place. It was our sins that nailed him there, not anything he had done. He died that we might be forgiven. If you believe that, I mean really believe it. I'm not talking about just the head awareness of it, that there was a person who walked this earth in history nearly 2,000 years ago. That's not what I'm talking about. If this has gripped you that when Jesus died, he died instead of you, if you believe that with all your heart, not merely your head, if this so grips and motivates you that you want to live, for him who died for you if you'd be prepared to not only believe it with your heart but openly confess it acknowledge it with your mouth for with the mouth confession is made unto salvation Jesus said whosoever confesses me before men him will I confess before my father which is in heaven now the other side to that coin is that if we're ashamed to do that and publicly identify with him now then of us will he be ashamed when he comes with his father and the glory of the angels. That's the alternative, no midway again, you notice. If you will not merely say, because talk could be cheap, it's not just those who say, Lord, Lord, that are going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but those that do his will. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Here's an acid test. Here's a way to demonstrate. lady out above all others demonstrate your love to the Lord Jesus by being willing to openly acknowledge him and to take the step of obedience in baptism just as he died on the cross was buried in the tomb and rose again the third day would you love him enough to die to your old way of life to bury it and have done with it and rise to walk in newness of life if you want to be sure that your name's written in the Lamb's book of life, you will need to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the breaking of bread, in fellowship and in prayers. There are ways that you can know. Know beyond shadow of doubt. Know here and now. Not by and by when you die. Know now. I tell you, the more I understand the prophetic scriptures the more I clearly see what's coming upon this generation, yes, I believe this generation, the more I want to be sure that my name's written there. I am sure of it. I have no doubts. Where do you stand? Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? When the clouds unfold their wings of strife, when the strong tides drift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? Now we whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Wouldn't you like to make sure of that yourself? You see what the Word of God has to say. 
It is the highest court of appeal. It is the last word. We're going to sing that hymn to which I've just been alluding to give you the opportunity to do something about it. If you are sufficiently concerned, that is, if you feel this has just been another academic exercise and, uh, well, the Bible does sort of say that, but, um, well, friend, you are making a decision whether you're aware of it or not. You're making a negative decision, and a negative decision means you don't want your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You're going to be hoodwinked utterly by the satanic counterfeit and share his end. I'm not trying to frighten anybody. Let's just look at the cold, hard logic of the fact. Some people say to me sometimes, how could God be a loving God and there be such a place of punishment that the Bible talks about? I want you to be clear about this. God never intended not the least of his creatures to share the fate of the devil and his angels. That was never intended. It's not God's willing that any should perish, but that all should come unto him and live. That everybody's name should be written in that Lamb's book of life. That's God's wish. But neither will he go against your determined wish. This is not a question of press ganging. If you're going to have your name written in that book, it'll be because you want it so. And you'll accede to his way to make sure. We have an anchor that keeps the soul. So many of us are going to sing that with the absolute abandon and enjoyment. But every verse is asking a question, you notice. Will your anchor hold in the straits of fear when the breakers roar and the reefs near? Now this is talking about the turmoil of life. Have you got something solid to hang on to? Or does life really knock you about? I tell you, we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure. Do you want to be in on that? We're singing this so that you'll have a chance to do something about it. As we rise to sing the hymn 471, if your name's not written in the Lamb's book of life, what about it? I beg you, I pray that you'll do something. Don't just merely think about it. Don't merely be disturbed about it. Do something about it. Do the New Testament thing by believing in the heart and openly acknowledging him with the mouth. He died openly to acknowledge you. Will you not openly acknowledge him? That's the proposition.